Kirk McCullough from Kansas City, uh, here to talk about acute, uh, acute ruptures and the treatment of that. You know, so as we look at this, obviously this is a devastating lower extremity injury to any competitive athlete, certainly even the weekend warriors as well. You know, we talked about the operative and non-operative treatment. Clearly, historically, operative has been favored over non-operative, the classic type of, uh, of, of the immobilizing type of rehab compared to the functional rehab that Andy was alluding to. You know, the Lanto article that he mentioned, obviously this one's in incredibly important as far as not only the structure of it being a randomized control trial, but then also really looking at function. Looking at an outcome that simply is just re-rupture is not enough. You know, you need to be able to understand how are these patients functioning in both of these groups. And as he highlighted already, there was a significant difference in this study between the non-operative functional rehab group and the operative as far as their ability to have strength not only at six months, but also at 18. So, you know, the issue is why is there a debate why, in, regarding treatment in athletes? Well, the issue is that infections, wound problems, and a lack of return to baseline function is not something that's simply an unhealthy, poor access patient problem. We're seeing some of this in the same, even within this professional athlete, elite athlete population. Look no further if you're an Indianapolis Colts fan with Robert Mathis and the 10 surgeries he had within a, within a short nine month time frame because of the infection he had from his open repair as well as the Philadelphia Phillies' Ryan Howard it completely changed his career uh, and, and something that he was never really able to truly get back from because of all of the complications he had. You know, so what are we looking for as far as recovery and rehab with our treatments? We're looking for early motion like Andy was talking about, an accelerated rehab that's critical in the recovery process. It's gonna promote tendon healing. It's allow those tenus sites to lay the collagen down in a linear fashion. That's not only gonna create the tendon that's, that's strong and more like the native tendon, but also one that's not gonna re-rupture as easily. And that's gonna allow for that muscle tendon unit that we talked about. Less disuse muscle atrophy because you're getting this going. You do, not want to you do not want to mobilize these patients for an extended amount of time trying to let a wound heal. And it's demonstrated less tendon elongation and faster return to function in multiple different studies. So, the argument then, in my, in my opinion, is, is percutaneous or mini open the answer? Are there complications such as wound and sural nerve injury low to compare it to the non-operative treatment? And can we reliably recreate and maintain that muscle tendon unit integrity, avoiding the excessive elongation? And as far as mini open versus extensile opens, it's strong enough to safely perform the aggressive early rehab protocols that are so important to get these high-level athletes back. And can they return to sport equally or, or heaven forbid, even at a better rate? So looking at the biomechanics, this is a great study out of HSS uh, that was talking about uh, looking at the difference between the Achillon and the PARS technique and just showing that when you use these locking sutures, especially now with the suture tapes, there's a greater load to failure compared to non-locking and a more resistance to two millimeter gapping with a high number of cycles. It's exactly what we see with the open crack out. And so their conclusion was this construct's able to resist forces simulating early rehab compared to the non-locking. So as far as looking at return to function, what we wanted to try to see is what's this like in sports? You know, so historically, the Preak article is one that, that permeates the, the, the media as far as any time an NFL athlete has an injury. This was an internet-based query of 31 ruptures identified over the 97 to 2002 seasons. 10 players, or 32%, never returned to play, and of those that did, they saw a 50% reduction in a fantasy-based, uh, uh, fantasy sports-based metric, being able to see and compare them preoperatively to postoperatively. But they realized that there was limitation to this and future studies will still need to be done. Looking at the NBA, uh, you know, the National Basketball Association League and as far as its effect in basketball, 18 NBA athletes over the 88 to 2011 seasons, average age of 30, seven and a half uh, years in the league, 39% of these athletes never returned. 11 only returned for one and of the eight that played greater than two, statistically significant reduction in their performance. So clearly they may be getting back but they're never the same. Then fast forward to another internet-based article is recently published by the Methodist Group in Houston. Once again, an internet-based query. Their results were that 72% returned for at least one season. Match controls had a longer career by at least one season compared to the operative, but performance decreases were still seen, particularly in linebackers and running backs. And then looking at one of the first studies that was looking at many open or type or continuous type techniques using the Ma and Griffith technique, Jim Bradley did this along with Taboni. What they saw 27 patients with acute rupture, 15 which were done with an open repair and a turndown compared to a percutaneous Mon Griffith. They saw no differences in strength, but unfortunately saw two re-ruptures with that type of percutaneous technique and therefore concluded that open repair had to be done in these athletes. As far as looking at return to function in sports now with the mini open, 
you know, what we, what we saw at least initially in the England, you know, out of London, Mafuli et al. in their FAI article in 2011 looked at 17 elite level athletes, most of which were soccer players. 100% of them were able to return to their prior sport in an average of about 4.8 months postoperatively. They did have two superficial wound complications, which were simply treated with oral antibiotics, never needed an open IND. And that's just some pictures of what that, if no one's familiar with the Ma, the Ma and Griffith technique. So we initially published the not, first nine NFL athletes treated with the PARS system. All these athletes were able to return to football. There were two undrafted free agents injured in their original uh, camp, training camp uh, time with the team that one returned to CFL, the other returned to Arena Football League, but all of them were able to return, particularly the ones that had already established themselves in the league. There were no re-ruptures, no sural, sural nerve or wound complications. And then looking at that further, there's been numerous professional athletes that have been done, primarily by Dr. Anderson, and the follow-up NFL data we will be publishing soon, an additional 21 athletes with this same type of trend seen in them as well. So as far as looking at the many open outcomes, you know, this is in the non-professional athlete, Andy did a, a wonderful study while he was uh, there at Ortho Carolina, as he's already highlighted, which once again showed 6% fewer complications and that a higher a return to baseline function was seen at five months. 98% of those PARS patients, even in someone who may not have all the access to care that a professional athlete would, compared to 82% in that open cohort. So then looking at accelerated rehab, you know, the big thing about this is understanding, you know, as we talked about, you want to get these patients moving, you want to get them walking. So a well-padded plantar flex splint for seven to 10 days, passive motion with dorsiflexion only to neutral, starting at around 10 to 14 days, no focus dorsiflex stretching, at least in my patients, until a minimum of three and a half to four months, but then you start walking them partially and progressively weight-bearing in about two and a half to three weeks, typically fully weight-bearing in the boot at five, and then progressively weaning to a shoe and starting some running activities at around three months. As far as a case example, this is briefly highlighted by Mike. You know, so one of the things that really got me excited about this was the ability to take care of Ike. So Ike came to me five years into the league, had just the prior year, had a season-ending injury, and then three games into this season, had a second one. And so as he, you know, talked about in the, in the, in the media, you know, at some point you just have to realize maybe it's not meant to be. But then we started talking about some of the early results that we had seen, especially with Terrell Suggs that was already highlighted. And so all of a sudden for him, hey, maybe this isn't the end. Maybe there's some hope with this. So as far as looking at how we executed this, this is before we even did a, a deep dermal stitch. This is how this wants to close. This is after I just simply put some derma bond on it and just covered those needle holes with some, with some, zero, uh, some zero, zero form. So that's one week, that's two weeks, that's six weeks, and that's three months. So it's one thing to then see that, but then what was the, what was the ultimate results on the field? So, you know, hope becomes reality for him. So not only does he come back from this, he comes back in the best form of his tenure, the BEEP test, which is a, a functional uh, ex exam that they will do, being able to test how fast can they do change of direction running. It was, the, it was the best he had ever had in his career. And then ultimately became not only just the, the early on mid-season favorite to, for the defender of the year, but then ultimately became the defender of the year and having never been a part of the, the, the national team was then ultimately able to achieve that goal of his uh, starting in January. So in conclusions, the argument justification for surgical repair of Achilles tendon rupture remains viable, just as Andy was talking about the goals. You must recreate tension in that muscle tendon unit to, to be able to renew the power generating potential of the gastroxoleus. You must minify, minimize soft tissue disruption to maximize soft tissue healing. Safely initiate early range of motion and weight bearing to get that tendon to start to heal like it needs to instead of the haphazard that we see typically with immobilization. And early studies demonstrating PARs improved results, less complications across all patient populations are, are furthering our desire to be able to use this in all patients. So thanks.